All right, this is gonna be so much fun because this time of year, every year I reevaluate all of the stuff that I'm doing to see if, um, am I working on the right stuff? Should I be aware of new trends going forward? And I sort of summarize the stuff that I think is gonna be really important for me going into the new year. And I wanna share my top five trends with you, but I gotta give you a warning. I'm gonna tell you something here in just a second that could potentially be a big time waster because it's so much fun and you can get, um, you can kind of get carried away fiddling around. And uh, so that's the warning. <laughs> so sometimes researching productivity can become really unproductive <laughs> if you just start wasting your time with it. But with that disclaimer out of the way, I've been playing around a lot with custom GPTs. So, um, and there's GPTs for everything. The, the problem that I had up until recently is I didn't know how to find lots of them. Like I only knew like the, the, the recommended ones in chat GPT or whatever. Now I gotta tell you, nothing's sponsored, nothing's paid. Everything is just the stuff that I'm doing. And I'm gonna put links down below in the description for all of this stuff. So if you wanna you know, click on some of the stuff and, just, and explore it yourself, you can. But these custom GPTs are awesome. And there's GPTs for everything. Like there's one that I've been using, it's called a WordPress wizard that's dialed in for Beaver Builder. So like if you have a p quick question, like how do I change the header or whatever, you can actually get really specific instructions on how to do stuff in different page builders. In, in particular, this one's for Beaver Builder. And it just speeds up development really fast. It's a really, really fast way to remind yourself how to do some stuff or learn how to do some, some interesting stuff in WordPress. But there's other stuff too. There's like any kind of language you wanna learn, whether it's like a spoken language, like you wanna learn Spanish or something or a coding language, you wanna be better at PHP. There's one called PHP Expert, where you can like submit your code and it can optimize it for you or help you debug co uh, code and stuff. It's just such a huge time saver. It's really cool. Uh, there's another one called Logo Creator. <laughs> this is where I wasted a lot of time this morning. I was just messing around making some logos. I said, hey, make a logo for Blue Theory and see, you know, and, and it'll ask you some questions. So you go in there, uh, and again, there's, there's links to all these GPTs in the description. But uh, you go in there and it'll start asking you some questions like what color do you want to use? How complex do you want the logo to be? How playful do you want it to be? Do you want a mascot or is it just a word mark or whatever? So you answer a few questions and then it cranks out some different logos for you. Like, look at these. These are the ones I just created this morning. Now, I don't think I'm going to go change my branding or anything, but I mean, it's, and, and I don't even know what I'm doing. It's like, I just discovered it this morning. And so I, I haven't practiced or, or like learned how to really get the best results out of it. I'm just answering the questions and getting these results pretty cool. Uh, so there's over 53,000 GPTs. <laughs> there's so much stuff that you can discover. And, um, and there's all kinds of ways to search for them. So one is if you can go to gptshunter.com, so it's gptshunter.com. Um, there's some other stuff too, where different ways to search through GPTs. I'll put links in the description for those things, but that'll give you access to tons of custom GPTs. And it's so, the, the productivity boost that you can get out of it is huge, except for one thing. It's like playing with it sometimes can be unproductive, but once you find the ones that you want, like the WordPress wizard or the PHP expert or whatever, you can really get some stuff done really, really fast. So custom GPTs, that's thing number one. I'm really excited about right now. It's a lot of fun. And I don't know if a ton of people even know, know how to, I didn't know how to find them. Uh, up until recently. So I wanted to share that with you. Uh, thing number two, um, before you leave the channel, don't forget to subscribe. I've got so much stuff coming up for the next, for the new year with tips and ways to do web design more efficiently and to land clients and to crank your prices up and all that stuff. So before you leave the channel today, don't forget to subscribe. Also, um, there's a new YouTube feature that when I say subscribe, the little subscribe button kind of lights up a little bit. I don't know if you're noticing that. It seems to be rolling out gradually. But anyway, don't forget to th like and subscribe. And then number two is um, pick an AI tool and learn it. So one of the things that I think is gonna be really important if you haven't already is to kind of settle on a set of tools that you like and then learn them kind of relatively deeply. And, um, and so I've got two tools that I really use uh, almost primarily, almost exclusively. I use ChatGPT and I use Notion. And both of them have AI kind of built into it. Uh, Notion is a little bit different because Notion's like an app that's like, like a, like a note-taking app where you can write all kinds of stuff, but it's got AI built into it, but it's got different AI engines. So it's not just chat GPT, there's Claude and different types of um, generative engines built into Notion. And depending on what kind of content you're creating or what kind of questions that you ask the AI, it might use a different engine. So you get significantly different results than you would get if you just went straight into chat GPT and stuff. But I got three quick tips for things that I'm doing that I feel like are helping my prompts get me better results. I'll just share these three tips real quick with you. The first one is I find that if I provide an identity for the AI before I start talking to it, I get much more targeted information. The, the answers it gets me gives me back are in the context of what I'm looking for. So for example, I'll say you are a marketing expert or you are a um, 
I don't know, whatever it is that I'm looking for. You are a PHP guru, whatever, something like that. And I think that makes a lot of sense too, because if I were asking regular people stuff, the person that I'm asking impacts the answers a lot. So like if I say, hey mom, what, what's your favorite type of mobile phone? She'll probably say, oh, the iPhone that I have is really great. It's easy to use. I've been using it for a long time. It just does everything I want. I don't have to think about it. But if I ask somebody who's like really into like technology and optimizing stuff and tweaking and playing and just kind of kind of like a kind of like a nerd type person, then that person might be like, hey, I really like Androids because I can customize everything and whatever. And like, and, and I actually find myself kind of in the middle. Like I like both. But um, but anyway, the point is, depending on who you ask, you'll get a different kind of response. And so I think that's why it's important to tell the AI who it is that you that you want them to pretend to be so that you can get answers in the context of of that paradigm. So anyway, that's thing number one, just assigning an identity. Thing number two is I found that affirmative prompts work better than negative prompts. So for example, if I want to create content that does not start with a question, if I say, do not start with a question, I think sometimes it misses the word not. <laughs> it says, do start with a question. And then it just whatever I'm telling it not to do, it just does. And I think a better approach, at least for, for, at least for right now and for me, is to do it the affirmative way. And so instead of saying, do not start with a question, say, start with um, an intriguing and inspiring statement or something like that. And then that way it starts with the intriguing and inspiring statement. So that way you can kind of get it to do more, more of what you want to do just by telling it specifically what to do rather than saying what to avoid doing. And then the third thing that I've been doing that's been really eye-opening is what I refer to as iterative seeding. So um, say, for example, I want it to make a logo. Like when I did the logo creator thing, it kind of built in this process in the, in, into the workflow. But even if I was to create something like, um, like say I wanted to, to write a YouTube description for this video and I wanted it to sound like my voice, um, what I would normally do would be say, I'm going to write a YouTube description for this video, blah, blah, blah. Ask me questions until you understand how to write in my voice. And then it'll say, well, how, you know, how, complica how complex are the sentences and what grade level should the person be when, when you know, in terms of the writing, you know, write at a fifth grade level, write at a college degree level, stuff like that. Do you use a lot of superlatives and, and, and exclamations and stuff like that? Or are you more mellow? So you'll just start asking all these different questions and I'll answer them. And then eventually it gets to the point where it understands what I'm doing. And the same thing is true for um, ask me questions until you understand what my business model is so you can help me come up with different marketing strategies. You know, is there any sort of iter iterative seeding where it's like it asks a question, you answer it, you ask an answer, ask an answer, kind of doing it in chunks um, has gotten just vast. Like that, that really opened up the whole world of AI to me personally. Because the, the other al alternative where you just say, hey, write a thousand word blog post about roofing or something, like I think that's the wrong way to use AI. So anyway, those are three AI tips that I think have been really helpful. Um, so I got, I got a couple other things. I want to shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit more about lifestyle and, and mindset because I have some, some of those trends that I think are going forward in the future as well. And so kind of getting to number three, um, I want to encourage you, and I, I do the exact same thing, and I'll share, share with you what I'm actually doing here in a second, but I want to encourage you to change who you interact with going into the future. And I don't mean get, getting rid of old friends, I mean adding in new friends. Like, be proactive in thinking about new people that you can interact with. And um, so one of the things that I'm going to be doing is I'm planning to set up a, probably a monthly meetup. At, there's, a, there's a coffee shop down the way, and I'm just going to invite all the local businesses to show up and I'll help them with stuff for free for probably about an hour or so, some at, you know, once a month at, at the local coffee shop. And I think I'm going to do that for two, a couple, maybe several reasons. One reason is it, it helps the local coffee shop because we'll probably schedule it for something like two o'clock in the afternoon where most coffee shops aren't that busy. And that's going to bring people in and um, buy some coffee at a time that the coffee shop normally isn't too busy. But the other thing is I get to meet all the local businesses around, which is going to be really helpful for some of the other tips that I'm going to give you here in just a second. But, um, but I just get to know new people that I otherwise wouldn't be interacting with if I just you know, was working all the time. And it's like one hour a month. It's like, I've got an hour a month, you know? So I, I feel like that's a great idea for just, to, just, just reaching out to people and just developing new, like being proactive at developing new relationships. If you don't feel like you can do it in person, then you could at least join some communities, like find communities online that you can be part of. It doesn't even, I'm not even talking about paid community. I mean, you can join Blue Theory, be part of our community, it'd be awesome. But it doesn't have to be a paid community. It could be anything. But just surround yourself with a new group of people that you commit yourself to interacting with on a regular basis because it just opens up your mind as to what's going on. It keeps you abreast of the 
the, the reality of how you can help people, and you make great friends and new relationships too. So that's one of the things that I think is really important going forward. And, and I actually do this every year. I try to think of a new way to introduce new people into my life in some way. In this coming year, I think these, um, these, these coffee shop workshops are things that I think so. In fact, I've even been thinking about naming it, something like uh, leads and lattes or something like that, or um, I don't know, trends and friends. I don't know. So you guys just name the coffee shop, meet up something, and then do it. Um, oh, here, and another one too is, is it's kind of in the same vein as this one. This doesn't count as an extra tip. This is like a bonus or whatever. But um, shift more towards like a leadership mindset. Instead of, instead of always saying, you know, you tell me what to do and I'll do a great job implementing what you say, think about telling other people what they could be doing to get better results based on your expertise, right? So like, like lead people, like, like develop that leadership mentality. I'm not talking about being bossy and telling people what to do. I'm, telling, I'm talking about take the experience that you've gained and share it with people in a, in a leadership capacity. Like, this, like, these, uh, like the trends and friends thing I was just talking about, like going to a, to a coffee shop or whatever and telling people things that are working for you and maybe that will work for them too. And maybe you can even collaborate on stuff like that. And do you ever think about like um, how important little decisions that you make in your life actually are? Do you ever, for example, I'm a big fan of the movie Back to the Future. And remember in Back to the Future, Marty goes back in time. He goes from 1985 to 1955. His parents are kids and everything. And he's like, oh, no, I'm, I'm in 1955. I got to get back to the future. He goes to find Doc. And Doc is like, well, you know, I have no way to get you back there. They figure out there's going to be this lightning storm There's a, it's a, that's a week away. And Marty's like, well, that's, that's cool. I, I could spend a week here in 1955. You could show me around. We could see what it's like. And Doc's like, no, don't do anything. Don't go anywhere. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anything. Don't move anything. It can radically change the course of the future, even putting into, into risk your own existence, right? It's like one little thing can have such a cascading effect on the future that you destroy your own existence. And so then, of course, Marty then goes and does that very thing with inter inter interrupting the relationship between his parents and everything to the point where he's even evaporating while he's playing the guitar and stuff. But do we ever think about our current day actions having that degree of an impact on the future? Like remember, so even in Back to the Future 2, Marty goes and buys a little book. He bought, buys the sports almanac. And then that one decision to go into the store and buy that one book radically changed the future. And in this case, in a very negative way, where everything like Biff was now like this, <laughs> this crazy rich billionaire that wrecked the entire future and his mom was... Uh, married to him and his dad had gotten murdered and all this other stuff because he bought the all that one thing he went into the store and bought a book and had that huge impact on the future and then of course there's the opposite side where you can have we can do like a few small changes like like for example George standing up to Biff and punching him out at the at the dance or whatever radically changed his life in a positive direction where where he was like successful and wealthy and had this great house and like all this other stuff because of one action. So do you ever think about this so like what if the one action that you could take today has that degree of an impact on your future? And not only that but you could have the same impact on like the cascading effect that it has on everybody else as well. And so that's why I think it's really important to expose yourself to new relationships and to, to think about the things that you do on a day-to-day -day basis right now as having the impact of writing the future in, in the same way that these like Back to the Future movies and stuff kind of depict the importance of those events. And I think it's easy to overlook the fact that the choices that we make right now literally write the future for us going forward, which is why I like to do these videos and that's why I like to think about what I'm doing on, at least on an annual basis to figure out what to do going forward. So, um, so I think that's really important. And um, number four. So the fourth thing is, um, I think it's really important, and we, uh, this is something that's not new. I talk about this all the time, but I think it's really important to pick a niche and go with it. Like learn the niche, and because it, like the other things, like as you're introducing yourself to new people, and as you're as you're bringing leadership to those people, so that you can write the future for them and with them, then it's really helpful to actually focus on a particular way that you can help people. And it's very difficult to, to become a leader in a generic way. Have you ever thought about that? Like if you were, there, there are no generic leaders. You can't be a leader in a generic way. You have, to, you have to know how to do a particular thing and then show people how to be successful in that area. And I think that's why it's really important to pick a niche. But it doesn't have to be a, a specific industry. It could be a category of industries. Like for example, home service businesses or health and wellness or health and fitness. So there's, there's ways that you can broaden out the scope of the people that you can impact while still 
focusing on a niche and helping people. So if you have any questions about that, you know, just leave some comments or I have a whole course right here. It's called uh, Niche Mastery. It's lead.blue slash leads. You can go there, it's totally free. You don't have to buy anything. And it'll really dive into the idea, especially the Niche Mastery video of the, the idea of categories of niches. So that maximizes your ability for impact while also giving you a really solid path forward for specializing in something. And then the last thing, and this is the thing I think is probably the most important for us as web designers and, and online marketers going forward into the future, I think small favor marketing is absolutely the ticket going forward. Nobody wants to just be sold websites anymore. Even if you do find somebody who wants to buy a website, it's just low ticket $500 projects and stuff like that with no recurring revenue in the mix. And I think most people are pretty much fed up with all of that and they don't want it. Especially, I've noticed that since the pandemic more, more so than ever before, People want results, people want help, people want leadership, people want you and me to help people. And I think the best way to start off that relationship is saying, hey, I've got this one little thing that I can do for you that really helps, and then invite them to participate in something. Feature them on your website, feature them on your blog, feature them in a podcast, give them some kind of a mobile app. Like I have this mobile app that I built where you can, um, you can give it to people for free and they can invite their clients to leave Google reviews for them. There's like a send by text, send by email, scan a QR code. So if you're standing right there with somebody, you just finished with a customer, you can say, hey, scan right here. And then their phone is looking at the, at the Google review form. They can just type in a quick review. And it's super easy to build. Like if you want me to show you how to build it, you can join Blue Theory. I'll show you that's part of the course there. But that gives you a great free lead magnet where you can just say, hey, can I give you this app for free? And then you can get some more reviews. And as you're talking about the reviews, you can say, well, let's take a look at your website. Are you building an email list? Can I optimize your Google profile for you? You know, all this, do you have an online calendar? What's your call to action? How's your headline? Where are you getting traffic from? Like all these other things come from that small favor. And I think if you go back to one of the things we were just talking about, how these little small actions can literally write a brand new future for you and for your clients and for the people you're interacting with, I just feel like small favor marketing is 100% the way to go. And I think not only is it the way to go, but it just beats everything else. Like I think it, it beats SEO and just hoping that people um, find you organically and all that stuff. In fact, I have a whole video, like check out this video right here and I'll show you why I finally ended up having to break up with SEO. So check that out and I'll see you right there.